Well, hi everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to learn more about the International Cost Estimating and Analysis Association, or as you know and love it, ICEA. I'm here with Dr. Christian Smart from Galarath and formerly of the Missile Defense Agency, uh, but I'll be happy to go into detail on the things that you would like to know most about, and then I'll save plenty of time for Dr. Smart to get into what I'm sure is the hottest topic of today, our upcoming soft estimating, software cost estimating body of knowledge. So ICEA has been around for longer than it would seem. The Industrial Estimating Society of San Diego got started all the way back in 1960, which later became the National Estimating Society in 66. And meanwhile, the Price Users Group became the International Society of Parametric Analysts in 1978. And then later the Institute for Cost Ana Analysis, we joined with NES to form the Society of Cost Estimating and Analysis in 1990. So SCIA and ISPA, those are names you might have heard, came together, came together to form ICEA back in 2012. The mission statement is pretty easy for you to read, and I'll spare you reading that. We're a nonprofit, so that means the money that we make on membership and workshops goes back into member value, offering new products and services or improving on the ones that we have. ICEA's baby is the Cost Estimating Body of Knowledge, or CBOC. CBOC is a 16 module curriculum whose primary use is for preparation for our two certification exams. While we offer training courses based on CBOC at our professional development and training workshop, CBOC is mostly used for self-study or studying in small groups. I've actually talked to some members who had a bunch of people from the same company or, or division that were preparing to take the exams at the same time. And they formed a study group where one of the members of the team was assigned to a module to teach to the rest of the group. And that worked out as a good way for them to learn. So there's a lot of different ways to get everybody up to speed on CBOC. Oops, I went through it too fast. CBOC is available for purchase on the ICEA website and is sold as a collection of PowerPoints, PDFs, and Excel spreadsheets on a USB thumb drive. We're working on developing version 2.0 of CBOC that we intend to be a browser-based curriculum and we hope to release that in 2021. If you are now an ICEA member, you can look at the beta version of CBOC 2.0 by logging into your ICEA profile. And there you can send us your comments and feedback that we'll use towards making the next version. But that being said, 1.2 will be, be the official version of CBOC that we will reference and base the exams on until we announce 2.0. And boy, will you hear about that when we do. <clears throat> so certification. Um, we offer two levels of certification, the PCEA, which is mostly intended for people who are just getting started in their cost career paths, and the CCEA, which is to designate experience and expertise for people who've been around for a while. Both certifications are great ways to add a few letters after your name on your business cards or LinkedIn profiles and to show the world that you know your stuff when it comes to cost estimating and analysis. The next part can be a little confusing. So both the PCEA and the CCEA are granted by taking the same exam. People who are only going for the PCEA can take one, part one of the exam, stop there and get their PCEA. But if you want the CCEA, you have to take both parts one and two. You can take both parts of the exam if you're before you're eligible for the CCEA. Uh, what'll happen if you pass both parts without the five years of experience, we'll give you the PCA and then it'll automatically upgrade to the CCA once you hit the five years. Another thing that the five years is relevant for is, relevant for is recertification. CCA certification lasts for five years and you can avoid having to take the test again if you collect a certain amount of continuing education, volunteer work, or other ways to show that you're still on top of your game. And as long as you keep up with training, it's actually really easy to collect the necessary recertification points after five years. The PCA, however, is only valid for three years and isn't renewable by points. Our intention is that you'll advance from the PCA to the CCA over time and won't need to renew it. But for those of you out there who want to keep your PCA and only your PCA, you're going to have to take the test every three years. And regarding the test, we had some exciting news in the past couple of months. The certification exam has entered the 21st century and we are online. You can take your exam anywhere, anytime on an, a browser. It doesn't need any special software to download. All you need is a computer with a mic and a camera to take it. Um, the coolest part, in my opinion, is the virtual AI proctor that monitors the exam for you. Uh, it can tell whether you've been looking away from the screen for a long time or if you opened a new browser window and it even looks for things like cell phones, although it still hasn't quite learned what a cell phone versus a coffee cup looks like yet, but we're 
we're getting there. Our team in the office is able to have a report that we can look through to make sure what the AI thought it saw is in fact what it saw, and we can get the results back to you faster than we ever have been. Uh, the investment and price of getting a certification is pretty reasonable, as you can see. Um, it definitely makes sense to join ICEA before you start down the path to certification because you'll make up the membership cost in the member versus non-member price for CBOC right away. Um, if you have questions about certification, that's, you know, those are usually the things, that's the thing we get the most questions about. We've made a FAQ page. Uh, it's really easy to get to from the certification menu on the ICEA website. Um, and uh, look at that, the 2020 workshop picture is there back from when we were full of hope and had no idea what this year would turn into. Um, I can't believe I forgot to put a slide about this, but we are still planning to hold our 2021 workshop in May. And I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone as I'm sure you guys are all looking forward to being seen. Um, it's May 18th to 20th, 2021 in Minneapolis. And you'll find a similar picture to this one on the main page of the ICO website. Um, so you can find out more about what we've got planned in store for 21. Also up on the website is the workshop archives. We've collected all the papers and presentations from ICEA workshops and some of the ones from SKI and ISPA all the way back to 2007 and put them in a searchable table on iseaonline.com slash archives and you can search it by author or topic of year and then download the files that you're after. It's a great way to learn more about something you're just getting into or maybe you know refresh your memory on something you're pretty sure you saw but maybe not exactly sure when or by whom. Um, on the subject of training and workshops, the sad cancellation of 2020, maybe one of the silver linings that comes out of it is the distance learning series. Uh, these are free webinars that we do every Wednesday that are open to the public, and then we save them to our YouTube page afterwards in case you missed it. Next week's webinar should be pretty interesting to many of you. Uh, three gals from the Air Force are going to talk about their experience standing up a software factory. So go ahead and take a look at the ICEA events calendar for info on this and other events happening around the cost world. And especially for you CCEAs out there, sign up and attend so you can get some of those points that you need for recertification. Uh, another group of people from the Air Force actually told us not too long ago that their active military people were having some trouble getting their membership and certification expenses reimbursed. Um, so we decided that was not going to do it all. And we've created an active military discount for a reduced membership rate of $45 and 50% off of certification fees. So if you or a colleague are active military and you want to get certified or become an ICM member, we're happy to extend that discount to you. Um, just go on to IC online slash active military to check that out. And um, either I talk too fast or I guess, um, and I, don't, I haven't seen any questions come in, so I must be doing great. Um, it turns out the military aren't the only ones who can have trouble getting their memberships reimbursed. Uh, we came up with a solution that we hope will give you a way to get involved by getting a special professional development package where you can sign up for one of our premier training webinars for $100 and then get a free year of membership along with it. We've got a brand new paid webinar coming up on October 1st that qualifies for the professional development package featuring Dr. Smart and his colleague Kim Roy giving an introduction to machine learning for cost estimators. So if you've been on the fence about joining, this is a great way to see the value of ICM membership for yourself with a high quality training session. And even if you are already a member, you can buy the package for $100 and we will extend your membership for another year. Um, Having seen no questions or chats come in, I'd say that wraps it up for me um, before I hand it over to Dr. Smart. Take a peek at the ICO website if you're new or you haven't been there in a while. We've been making some really solid improvements and hoping to make your membership as valuable as possible for you and uh, all the cost-related professionals. So once again, I'm Megan Jones, Executive Director for ICEA. My team and I are here to answer your questions and can always be easily reached at ICEA and I see it online.org. And if you want to take it from here, Dr. Smart. Okay, can you hear, can everyone hear me? 
Hello. Ah, there you are. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have my mic muted, and then there's some really nice options here to turn your mic off versus unmute your mic. So I turn my mic off for a minute. So yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, you know, it's kind of the first part of this was kind of give an overview of ICEA and the organization where we're at. Uh, and this part is to talk about the actual topic of the presentation is the software cost estimating body of knowledge. I just will mention that the uh, machine learning training uh, very briefly, you know, that is a great way for especially government employees to get their membership reimbursed because they they do have the ability to, um, you know, there's a lot, quite a bit of training money probably should be out there, especially uh, since, uh, you know, no one was able to attend the conference in person since it got canceled. So, um, you know, for hundred dollars, you can get your organization to pay for the training and and get the the free membership as a as a bonus. Uh, we used to do that in Huntsville sometimes for um, uh, you know in person webinars and in, in person seminars, I should say. And uh, now we've kind of applied the same idea to to these webinars. So um, that's coming up on October first. So go to the next slide. We'll kind of get back to uh, the, the topic of the day. I'm sure everyone's interested in hearing about where we are with the software cost assuming by knowledge. So, you know, we've had, as Megan mentioned, the CBOC is kind of our big thing. We've had that for for quite some time, the cost estimating body of knowledge, which is sort of a general, you know, every, you know, estimating everything, which is typically largely hardware focused. There is a module in CBOC on software cost estimating, but we've recognized for some time that software is an ever increasing portion of total systems cost. You know, even the roads you drive on, there's such a thing as now as smart roads. You know, they're embedding sensors. You see that to some extent with uh, traffic lights and then traffic cameras where you can get a speeding ticket sometimes if you run a red light, but they're even embedding sensors in roads now. So even something that you think of as something that's, that's very simple is getting software embedded in it. Um, and there are some unique aspects of software cost has made that merit particular focus on this subject because uh, and, 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 you know, my experience, people that, that uh, do software cost has been there, people that that's all they do. And I see several people on the attendee list that are uh, SMEs and software cost estimating. So as, as a result of that, we decided to develop our own software cost estimating body of knowledge. And we plan to finish the initial version in early 2021. We're currently drafting that right now and, uh, and we're well on our way to, to Get the get the uh, first version finished in early 2021. So we're gonna, in this part of the presentation, give you an overview of that. So if we go to the next slide. Okay. So kind of a little bit of history about this effort, and what we've been doing, because we've been working on this for a few years. Um, we initially in 2015 established this with, uh, in conjunction with Nesma, which is a group out of the Netherlands. Eric Vandervliet and Harold Herringing uh, have been involved in that, and they're two of the leaders of that group. And also the International Function Point Users Group. Um, and we started doing a little more work in 2016, establishing a curriculum and in 17, we actually presented seven software estimation training sessions at the conference in Portland. And in 2018, we had 14 CBOC training offerings at that year's workshop. Next slide, that was in Phoenix. And then we continued working on the project in 2019. Uh, I see a NESMA signed a memorandum of understanding. And there were 16 uh, software CBOC trainings offered at last year's workshop. So 2019's workshop in Tampa. Um, I was involved in teaching the, uh, this, the one on statistics and uh, along with Denise Nelson. And the same training was again offered in October of last year in, in uh, the Netherlands. And then we uh, started looking at, you know, really, uh, so there was sort of this draft body of material, but we wanted it to have sort of one voice and and sort of be written in one sort of style and we wanted it to be fairly standard. So um, we recognized that DAU had a really nice product that we could start with as a foundation. It is a little bit defense, is very defense focused, but we realized that, that there's enough uh, common core material that was there that we could use that as a as a stepping stone and then and build from there and then we could work to uh, sort of remove the parts that were defense oriented and add things that we thought might need to make it more general to a wider audience so that was uh, started with the bcf 250 material and we entered into agreement with dau to to use their materials and they agreed to let us uh, do that so uh, next slide 
Okay, and then 2020, I mentioned the, the partnership with DAU, and then we established a review group to collaborate and develop a, uh, a product. And uh, we've actually got a contract uh, with a, a software SME to actually do the drafting of the material, which is like the uh, initial CBOC, and the CBOC has been for a long time, a, largely a series of PowerPoint slides. We now have a narrative version where if you're a member, you can access that directly as Megan mentioned, um, we, we would like to eventually get, we plan to eventually get a narrative version as well, but recognizing that we only have time and uh, resources for one version, we're gonna start like CBOC did with a set of PowerPoint slides and then base the body of knowledge on that. Okay, that's, that's currently well underway. We're definitely on track. We are not, Unlike many projects, we are not behind schedule or over budget. We're actually operating on time and within budget. So uh, that's, that's, that's well on its way to being finished. Uh, like we said, the first edition will be a set of PowerPoint slides. That we, that, and so that uh, facilitates teaching the material and, and learning the material. So we can start doing uh, webinars. And eventually when the world completely reopens, we'll teach these things at the, at the uh, at the workshop. Hopefully we'll be able to teach this at the uh, Minneapolis workshop. And we're preparing a standalone specialty certification that will be due later in the year. So the basis, the body of knowledge, just like CBOC is the basis for the PCEA and the CCEA that Megan talked about earlier for our traditional cost estimating certifications. SCIBOC, software CBOC will be the basis for a specialty certification in software cost estimate. So, and like I said, uh, we're eventually going to make it a narrative version so that it's not just uh, a set of PowerPoint slides, but something that you can read like a book. Next. Target audiences. So uh, we, we recognize that, and one of the things that in, in putting this together is, and looking at the industry is, uh, the Defense Department does have sort of a, a standard way of, of uh, you know, in, in its curriculum in DAU and BCF 250 has a standard way of, of um, doing software cost estimating that it tries to promulgate to cost estimators. But the commercial industry really does not. Um, and so we, there's, a, there's a, real, uh, a real gap that we can fill with this product because there really is no commercial standard for software cost estimating that we are aware of. And we looked at and tried to see what we could find in terms of what's commercially available and there. We didn't find any. And, and uh, if you have comments or have other knowledge, we welcome your comments in the Q&A in the chat. Also the original equipment manufacturers, that's the OEMs, that's the, you know, the, uh, the Lockheed's, the Boeing's, the other, um, you know, the prime, well, sometimes I call the prime contractors in the defense and aerospace markets, government organizations. Um, this is similar to the BCF 250. So we have partnered with them, with them on that. Consulting firms, the, the quasi government organizations like the FRDCs, we want to make this a global, like we said, the BCF 250 is uh, defense focused and it's also US centric, but SCIBOC, our software SCIBOC will be um, I'm in, in partnership, you know, working with NASMA on this. It will be globally oriented. It's not going to be US centric and it will not be defense centric. It's going to be applicable to commercial organizations and other things. Also another uh, target audience is our academic institutions. And we're going to develop the, the, the software cost estimating value knowledge to, like I said, it's not U.S. focused or Department of Defense focused or even U.S. government focused, but make it broadly applicable worldwide. It will provide the users of the product to understand software cost estimating that will enhance the basic cost estimating analysis. And um, we're not going to try to, to uh, promulgate one particular type of software uh, sizing. There are a variety of camps in the software cost estimating community on, uh, you know, software lines of code is the right way to go, or you got you got to use function points, or you know something else. Um, we're going to present all the different sizing methods, so we're not we're going to be agnostic in the sense that we're not going to try to promote one particular software sizing method. We're going to present them all and provide a background for uh, for users and provide them the information they need to use any method that they want to choose. Uh, they can draw their own 
uh, conclusions about the merits of any particular method on their own, but we're not going to promote that. So this is going to be agnostic in that. So um, so we got a question from Bill Barfield. Hey, Bill. Um, so platform independent and language agnostic. Yes, I think it's pretty much going to be um, agnostic as to uh, C++ or ADA or Java, that kind of thing. So, um, um, so it's going to be uh, generic, you know, general in that sense. And provide guidance on the, the, the key things that are essential to software cost estimating. So next slide. Before we jump over to the next slide over on the Q&A tab, um, we got a question in there, well, a couple of them. Um, I see the one from Bill Barfield about, the, is it platform independent, language agnostic? Yeah. I think that's you, the case. Yep, yep. If you go to the next uh, tab over, so we've got... Um, Dan Strickland said more of a comment than a question that BC oh, okay. is. I didn't, I didn't see that. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> um, BCF 250 is an overhaul. Right. Oh, you got it. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, well, I'm sure we'll be, I mean, we do have an agreement with, um, DAU with BCF 250. So yeah, we'll be in touch with them. Um, you're going to have to forgive my acronyms here for uh, Marie's question. Is that uh, so? NGOs and non-government organizations. What? Uh, That's what I maybe? thought it was. Uh, well, we talk about commercial organizations. We've got OEMs, which are the Lockheeds and the Boeings. Um, so. Okay. Uh, Kelly, sit tight. Your question is going to be answered. Yeah, so they're, we're going to maintain the current CBOC. We're not getting rid of it. So that's going to always be there. And then software, and, and also, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel when we're doing the software cost testing body knowledge. It will be, we will assume some things from the cost testing body knowledge. There will be, um, so basically it's going to be an add-on to CBOC. If, if someone's already familiar with the cost estimating, uh, that's fine. They can, they can use CBOC, but it's basically an add-on to CBOC. Um, but when we're going to refer back to uh, for more uh, foundational material or where we talk about something foundational, you will need to to have the, the, the knowledge in CBOC for that. So uh, so that answers that question. Uh, appreciate Dan's comments. Good to hear from you, Dan. And uh, and I th Wade Wade then also asked a question. Um, oh, he, oh, he talked about the other the other the last uh, webinar. Yeah, that actually uh, ended prematurely, and um, they're 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 going to send out a recording of that. So. Um, that did get presented, but it, uh, but that the, the viewers got ended prematurely, I guess. So uh, you will have a viewer recording of that. Okay, so th this is kind of give you an overview of what the, the material is in terms of a high level outline. Lesson, so there'll be six lessons. Lesson one will be an overview of software cost estimating and how to recognize a software cost estimate if one were to bite you on the behind, um, you know, why it's important. And then lesson two, is the software development paradigms? You know, look at look at each development paradigm. You know, uh, agile is very popular right now, but but we recognize that not every project is agile. So we'll discuss all the different paradigms, the, the historical ones, as well as the more recent uh, runs like agile. So um, I see Peter Andrea has a question. We'll address that as we as we go over lessons one through six. Go to the next slide, Megan. Lesson three is preparing a software estimate. So all the steps that are required to that, and it's pretty similar to a regular cost estimate, but uh, we'll talk about the things that are particular to software cost estimating, uh, such as definition of planning, what's the scope, the collect collecting the data, normalizing it, analyzing it, developing the estimate. Risk and uncertainty is a key uh, component of any estimate, that includes software cost estimating, and there's uh, you know, all all our uh, all these projects are risky, and there's some uh, there's some evidence that software and IT estimates may be even riskier than some more traditional projects. And then how to document and present. Documentation is very important. When I was at Missile Defense, that was a a key thing. Is you need to make sure you do good, good documentation. A lot of people uh, often uh, skip this step or, or do this step uh, last, and um, you make sure that, that you know you document as you go. 
So that's that part of that. If we go to the next lesson. Um, lesson four is the tools and techniques to, to streamline it, uh, how to, uh, developing a CER, you know, using a cost estimating relationship can help save you some time in terms of um, developing an estimate. Also, if you don't have um, a lot of data on hand, it can be a way to, to uh, leverage um, past studies to, to uh, do estimates. Uh, how to do schedule estimating, those kinds of things, and then and then and then uh, off-the-shelf tools for developing uh, software estimates that will cover uh, SEER, you know, which my company produces, as well as other tools like uh, uh, Price, things like that. And then a key part of any uh, life cycle in terms of looking at the overall estimate is maintenance. Um, and for uh, some projects, operations and maintenance are, is, is, is the life is the uh, lion's share of the total life cycle cost. And so if you're going to maintain this software a long time, it could be the case it's, that's true for software as well. So we need to make sure that we cover software maintenance and we do that in lesson five. Talk about uh, why it's important, what are the drivers of that, uh, how to estimate it, and also take into account software obsolescence. Next slide. And then and then COTS and ERP, you know, there's, um, and so it's commercial off the shelf. You can't just always just buy something commercially off the shelf and then just use it without any changes. You have to integrate it. Uh, you may only buy a part of the software and then try to, have to figure out how to integrate it. You have to write what's called glue code to try to, to uh, take these into account. And there's also enterprise resource planning, which is uh, you know, trying to unify all the processes of an organization into one single um, software program or, or set of programs. And let me look at all the all the different characteristics of those two types of, of uh, software. So those are the three basic steps. And then we'll go. But then I'm going to uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So the next things we're going to do is just kind of go over over some show you some examples of some of the slides that we've developed so far as part of the process. So you can get a flavor of uh, a sample of of what's going to be in there. So uh, before I go into that, though, I will address Peter's. Uh, Peter's question, good to hear from you, Peter. Uh, appreciate your question. So will SkiBot be limited to ap application software um, or also address estimating the cost of software resident throughout the IT infrastructure, um, such as software used to manage data, operating systems, middleware, servers, storage, and networks, much of which might be in the cloud. Uh, I think it's mostly going to be the, we uh, have a little bit of a limit, limited focus in this in terms of uh, develop software as well as uh, integrating commercial off the shelf and e ERP type software. So um, I guess the bulk of the focus is going to be on uh, developed, you know, developed software, uh, not not just not going to to try to um, look at, for example, uh, operating system software specifically. It's, this will be somewhat uh, general. So um, so we got the next few slides. We'll go through. We'll talk about the, um, you know, kind of give you a flavor of everything. So that's one of the things we talked about early on is that software is increasingly an important part of all kinds of systems, whether you're, if you're trying to estimate a tank or an airplane, you know, one of the things they're looking at now, of course, with, with tanks, as well as all kinds of vehicles are autonomous vehicles, you know, you know, uh, you know, at some point in the future, you might have a tank without a driver. So that will require a great, great deal of software. Uh, so even things that you would traditionally would not think would be heavily software intensive are becoming software intensive and increasingly more so. So, um, so this is just one slide that talks about the uh, the increase in in software in all kinds of systems. Um, you know, we got a little graphic there on the Internet of Things. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a chart that I developed for another presentation, and it's actually uh, something that. Uh, discuss this material in my book, talk about costs and, and schedule growth. There's there are, are uh, costs and schedule growth are an enduring phenomenon for all types of projects, especially important for software projects. Includes a, there's a variety of reasons why that occurs. Optimism, imbalance between cost, schedule, and performance. You know, if you if you for example, if you underfund uh, what you're trying to do to achieve a specific outcome you're going to wind up it's going to wind up costing more you can't just dictate a lower cost and have it have it work out you have to consider and make sure that your cost schedule and performance objectives all align with each other 
Moore's Law. There's an exponential growth in technology over time. They've been predicting the end of Moore's Law for a long time, but as of 2020, it still seems to be going on. They, they keep seeing, saying that it's going to end, but they haven't uh, uh, found that it's going to end yet. Uh, black swans are unpredictable, rare, unprecedented events have a large impact. Uh, those occur from time to time. Uh, example of a uh, hard to predict event that has outside consequences is the current pandemic that we're that we're experiencing right now, the COVID-19. Um, and you know, like Wobegon, not everyone, everyone not everyone is above average. So sometimes performance scuff suffers um, just due to incompetence. Okay, next slide. We talk about uh, types of software estimates, different kinds of you know software intensive programs, the life cycle. This is, you know, out of this is based on the mill standard for work breakdown structures, but we're trying to make it generic um, for all types of software estimates. So it's not uh, just a military focus, but we are using that logical structure that is in the mill standard as a basis for this. Next slide. This is kind of the, uh, you know, the, the the different types of software paradigms. Sometimes uh, the and if it goes back to Barry Beam's book, uh, sometimes this uh, the paradigms are called life cycles, but that's kind of a confusing term because the life cycle is really the, the cradle of a project to the grave from the beginning to the end. The paradigms are the different types of ways that you can uh, develop software. So um, there are elements of both. We try to include both the predictive and the adaptive type methods. Here's an example of an incremental type thing. So. Those are the so that's those are all the different things there. So any other questions uh, or comments? Then we have a little time left. I messed up there. I was trying to. Uh, oh, okay. Did we uh, did we reach the last one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, Bill has a question. All right. I think you covered all the questions, uh, <clears throat> Megan and Dr. Smart. So we want to thank you. Oh, oh, we, have a, yeah, but we have, one, we have another question here, Bill, Bill Barfield. Thanks, Bill, for, that, for your question. To get the actual code for measuring or get its metrics from its sources, will the software cost estimating body of knowledge address legal considerations such as NDA, copyrights, patent protection, and maybe purchase needed? And we will talk about, um, we'll, we'll talk about the data collection and normalization and as well as some of the challenges of of getting the, the data. So we will address some of those types of things. It's a good question. Uh, it looks like Cami Mann asked if we can tell more about the exam structure. I assume you're talking about the software CBAC exam. And no, we can't tell you any more about the structure of that because we're not sure what it is just yet. Um, I, I imagine it will be like the current uh, exam structure. I mean, I just this is just me speculating. So don't hold me to this, even though we are being recorded. <laughs> So, uh, but you know, the current exam structure is largely uh, multiple choice based. And uh, I imagine that, and it's currently online. So I imagine that Skibok will also be offered online and it will also be uh, multiple choice based. We'll probably, probably be multiple choice type questions. Um, it'll probably, probably that. That's what, that's what I, I would imagine it would be. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of hard to do essays on an online platform. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We, well, yeah. We'll, have, we'll actually have you write some uh, lines of code, and uh, no, I'm just oh, kidding. yeah. Um, see if you can break the uh, the, the testing software. That'd yeah, be... that, yeah. That's true, yeah. <laughs> well, then, uh, Luis, sorry we had to interrupt you, but I think you can. You're doing it. doing great, doing great. We just wanted to again thank you and Dr. Smart for your presentation and your participation uh, on this year's ITCAS forum. I uh, also want to thank all attendees uh, to attend this presentation and and all attendees, if you please stand by after the presentation to complete the church survey. Other than that, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you.